So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, welcome back to the conference. We are really privileged to see each other in person. Uh, my name is Bo de Jarnoj. I teach at CU in Vienna, and I'm very happy to have a very short in introduction to this panel because Tomasz Molnar will be online and he will offer the wise comments. So let me just refer to why you should sacrifice your siesta for this afternoon meeting, explain that. And there are content-based reasons and persons-based reasons. And the persons-based reasons is that the presenters next to me, all of them, we lined up together, so you don't have to search for us, are excellent experts and have been excellent experts of the field for many years, in some cases I may say for decades. We agreed that I will not introduce them one by one. You see their name and affiliation in the program. Now content-wise, why should you listen to this panel this early afternoon? And there are many, many reasons for that. Let me just raise a few related to both the procedures. Um, one is how do we do with the fiction of non-entry, which is in the pact? And we all remember Amur and how that was defeated by the Strasbourg court, and now here we see it as a legal proposal. Should we accept that? How, what should we do with that? How to accept and relate to the fact that in, in the situation of crisis, people who belong to a group, the recognition rate of which is below 75%, may not have the right to remain after the first decision. How do we deal with that, that people can be pushed out even during the appeal per period uh, or phase, coming from groups which have a large recognition rate but smaller than 75%? How do we relate to the question that the responsible state will only cease to be responsible under the new regulation after three years, if it was the first country of entry, unlike at present when it is one year. Uh, does it really shift the emphasis towards the external states? And whether the independent national monitoring system will ever function, which is envisaged in this context. So as you see in the program, we will deal with the screening, we will deal with border procedures and detention, border procedures and asylum, and border procedures and return, and I'm very privileged of not being obliged to offer substantive comments now because we will have Tomasz Molnar online who will comment the presentations heard by that time. Um, I will, there is just one sentence to start with and then I will give the floor to Lira. And that is that I think that this phase, the screening and border procedure phase, is the most important in the whole process. It's like the opening and the first third of a chess game. The rest is just end game. It, it is, you know how to finish the game. Everything is determined and decided in this phase. So I do believe it was a wise decision. You, you came and didn't opt for the siesta, and Lira will prove that first, speaking about the screening at the borders. Lira, the floor is yours. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. Um, in uh, my short intervention, I will speak, uh, I will dwell uh, upon briefly on three points. First point uh, concerning uh, screening as a decision-making uh, tool rather than just a mere gathering of information and, of course, its possible implications. Secondly, I will look into some examples of inconsistencies between the screening regulation and, and other instruments that are being proposed, as well as uh, seemingly expansion of the uh, discretion of, of the member states. Um, and lastly, very briefly, I will try to reflect on how realistic is, is uh, uh, to implement what is envisaged. So just to briefly remind all of us that the screening procedure, this is a new procedure introduced by, um, that, that's uh, envisaged by the screening reg regulation of last uh, September, which has four main elements, uh, basically checking information uh, on the health uh, situation of the person, including the vulnerabilities. Uh, secondly, identity assessment. Uh, thirdly, security uh, risks, uh, screening for security risks. 
and uh, also uh, registration of biometric uh, data. The objective is um, uh, quite uh, simple, but it's twofold, is uh, to identify as, as soon as possible both the risks, but also the needs of persons uh, that are coming, and secondly, uh, to uh, refer them to, to certain uh, procedures. So if we compare uh, what is envisaged with uh, current obligations of the member states, uh, it doesn't seem that there are big news uh, on, on this uh, uh, point because member states carry out in one way or another, another either under the EU law or national law, in particular as a result of uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, they carry out uh, those uh, verifications. But what is uh, indeed new is the outcome of uh, this entire screening uh, procedure, uh, which uh, basically uh, will result um, in some implications, both for the asylum but also for the return process, um, indeed for, for the individuals concerned. So the proposal envisages that the outcome of the screening will be direction of persons to appropriate procedures, be it uh, asylum or uh, return procedure, but also it will impact on, um, let's say, which asylum procedure the person should, uh, uh, for the person, uh, which asylum procedure should be carried out, the border procedure, accelerated procedure, or um, a regular one. Uh, so the proposal envisages that the screening ends with so-called debriefing forum. So we see that it's not a formal uh, decision, and, and one may question why then I'm talking about the decision making. But uh, if we look at the consequences and the nature of uh, what the authorities are supposed to do, they are basically uh, going to decide on the basis of quite minimum information that they already uh, carry uh, collect right now, they are going to decide on which procedures to, to direct the applicants. Plus, uh, there will be clearly a uh, significant implication for individuals in terms of Article 47 of the uh, EU Fundamental Rights Charter, because one of the, or the third outcome of the screening is overall uh, there is a possibility to refuse the entry of the person. So it would be difficult to say that it would not affect the person uh, substantively. Now the whole process uh, has to take place quite fast, so in normal circumstances within five days. And also considering that uh, this is not a formal decision, so it's a, um, some kind of form where they tick uh, yes or no, uh, more or less um, uh, considering also that uh, uh, we are at the borders uh, where lawyers, where courts, uh, uh, where NGOs are not uh, easily available like in the regular procedures, then um, these outcomes that are envisaged, it can easily uh, place the individual in uh, procedurally very disadvantaged uh, um, position, which then uh, may lead to um, uh, wrong, wrong decisions, be it on... on uh, the channeling to the procedure, or even in some cases, uh, the risk might be also of uh, refoulement. So um, uh, that allows me to, to say that indeed, even though the proposal claims uh, that uh, it is mere uh, pre-screening is just mere information gathering, in reality, uh, all, uh, all uh, shows that indeed it's a decision-making uh, tool. Now, second um, aspect is uh, related to uh, how the uh, how the screening uh, proposal, how the screening procedure fits into uh, the whole package, uh, as, uh, asylum package. So there are some inconsistencies, and also there seems to be a tendency on some points to move back to the discretion of the member states rather than continue with European project, as, as Daniel calls it. Uh, so let me give uh, two examples that uh, I found quite stri striking. First one is about vulnerability assessments. Even if proposal very nicely says that special needs of persons have to be identified, that's part of the health assessment, they have to be taken into account. But then if you look in reality, there are some, some constraints there. Firstly, the health assessment, uh, where vulnerability assessment has to be part of it, indeed can be um, actually cancelled uh, in, in some, uh, some respects. Uh, for instance, if the person looks very well, uh, looks uh, like uh, the well-being of the person is, is good, 
uh, or let's say for people who uh, are not directly at the border because the procedure will, will work for both for those who are at the border but also for those who are in the territory. So it's another fiction that we might dwell a little bit uh, in more detail during the discussions. So um, uh, those persons who are in the territory, uh, for them, uh, the uh, state authorities may just decide that it's not relevant, it's not needed to carry out uh, that initial assessment. Now, it's called initial assessment, but it's not clear how it will be followed up, if at all, or it would be just considered that that's sufficient uh, what information was collected. It's also not clear uh, what kind of information will be collected on vulnerabilities, and um, it, it raises uh, really serious doubts, uh, indeed, what kind of information will be and how it will be used. Because if you look at the outcome, this debriefing form that will be the end of, of uh, the screening uh, process, it mentions just one simple thing. And there you click yes or no, whether there are uh, special, um, uh, special care uh, needs. Uh, and, and that's it. There is nothing uh, more elaborated. So the, it seems that on that there is uh, discretion of the member states um, left, even though in the present in instruments, asylum instruments, uh, you see it quite, uh, quite uh, well regulated. Second example is about reception conditions. And here it's... Uh, the instruments are quite inconsistent. Now, if uh, we look at um, what um, uh, the reception condition or the, the proposal for the recast reception conditions uh, directive envisages, it envisages and it picks up on, on the recent jurisprudence of uh, Court of, of uh, Justice that indeed reception conditions have to apply from the fir very first moment, not from some kind of uh, lodging uh, concept or registration, but indeed from the moment where the person asks for asylum. Uh, now, uh, with regard to uh, screening procedure, the Commission is very clear that uh, reception conditions uh, or reception conditions directive uh, should apply only when the screening ends. So then again, the question is what kind of reception conditions would be uh, applied? And here again, the discretion of member states is, is uh, discretion is, is left here. Of course, there are some indications, but these indications show that it's very, very minimum. It's emergency health care, essential treatment of illnesses, and that generally it has to be compatible with the charter. But there is nothing more. So with the screening, we see that there might be new uh, zones or islands, so to say, uh, emerging that are excluded from the EU harmonization or from um, so-called EU project. The last uh, point I would like to briefly touch upon is how realistic everything what is envisaged. Now, when the pact appeared, I thought it's not realistic, but uh, now I'm coming also from one country where it seems that some elements uh, are operating in practice and are operating well to, to a certain extent. It depends uh, who evaluates, uh, operate quite well. But um, what... Um, what is intended by uh, the screening is, of course, to speed up uh, the asylum processes, to, to do one process instead of, of several ones for several purposes. The question is uh, um, if we can speed, indeed, uh, the process if the information that is collected is minimum. And of course, it does not address, for instance, some of the uh, constraints in the return process, which deal with cooperation of the person, cooperation with country of origin. So it, it has nothing to do with that. So the question is how, indeed, it will uh, speed up, apart from merging the, the procedure. Uh, uh, secondly, the screening is supposed to take within five days in normal circumstances. But we see from the example of, of some of the member states that operated the hotspots, it's clearly it was not realistic. So the, the result of that was that people uh, got stuck at the borders, they accumulated, it created additional uh, problems. Now, if you combine it, and I don't want to preempt what, what uh, my colleague will speak about detention, but um, also pre-screening procedure is based on the fictitious uh, notion of, non of not admission into the territory, so people are in some kind of legal, legal vacuum. So uh, this, of course, uh, combined with uh, um, um, obligation to stay at the borders, which will uh, probably result in detention, of course, that uh, may, not, uh, may not really speed up uh, the procedures. So um, even if uh, the pact is not yet adopted, um, I believe this train already started to move in practice. 
with some member states. And uh, those uh, risks that I just mentioned or some of the detrimental practices indeed might be difficult uh, to stop. So in that respect, I would like really a little bit to uh, rebut on, on what Daniel was saying in, in the beginning, that uh, maybe there will be no uh, nothing uh, happening with the pact, but indeed practice shows that some elements are already implemented in practice. So sorry for taking a little bit more time, but um, we can also discuss in, in, um, in the question time some other aspects that would be worthwhile mentioning. Thank you, Lira. I mean, we know that yourself coming from Lithuania, you have a lot to add, but there's no doubt that Galina has a lot to add as well because she has published widely on detention and, and board, not border procedures in that sense, but in the broader sense. So Galina, we are really looking into your presentation to find out if these people are detained or they are not detained and why is that your conclusion? The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank Philippe and Lilian for inviting me uh, to speak here today, and also thanks to Nicole for making it all happen, and all the others who worked hard to make this happen. And it's really great to see you in person, finally, after such a long time. Now, my contribution addresses the use of detention in pre-entry procedures. And to make sure we're on the same page when we talk about pre-entry procedures, um, I, 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 I want to make clear that I denote with pre-entry procedures, procedures um, that are characterized by the fact that applicants are not allowed to enter the territory of the member states. Now, as I shall explain uh, in my presentation, it is this so-called fiction of non-entry which causes some of the most serious deficiencies in the pact when it comes to the protection of fundamental rights of migrants. Before I delve into the core of this claim, I want to point out, for clarity's sake, and also because I've seen some misunderstandings in some of the comments that have been written in the pact, non-entry does not mean that people are not on national territory or on European territory or on the territory of the member states. It only means that people have not been formally authorized to enter the territory. Now, the pact is silent on the reasons for non-entry, and I have some thoughts on, on, on it, but I think these would be better suited to flesh out in the, in, the, in the discussion because they do not pertain to detention. So it's time to turn to my core claim now. Pre-entry procedures complicate and endanger the effective protection of fundamental rights, the right to per personal liberty in particular. The pact determines that persons subject to pre-entry procedures, now that is both screening and the border asylum and border return procedure, are not authorized the, ent the territory of the member states. I can quote some sentences from the staff working document. Um, for example, during the screening, member states are required to apply measures pursuant to national law to prevent the persons concerned from entering the territory which in individual cases may include detention. According to the staff working document, during the screening, migrants would be held by competent authorities. And at the same time, the screening proposal leaves the determination in which situation the screening requires detention and the modalities thereof to national law. Now, Seeing that people that apply for protection at the external borders have a right to remain, a legal right to remain, and at the same time member states are obliged to keep them uh, from entering any further in the territory, they will have to be kept in some way or another. This is also clearly acknowledged by the Commission. In a closed area or space, or in any case isolated from the rest of the population. Now, also with regard to the asylum border procedure and the return border procedure, the pact is also not clear on what non-entry means for the personal liberty of migrants. Commission actually maintains that the border asylum procedure can be applied without recourse to detention. And that's a literal quote from the staff working document. But it adds that member states should be able to use detention and then in accordance with the grounds for detention and the reception condition directive. So we see the use of detention is left to national law in the screening. When it is used in a border asylum procedure, it is uh, to be regulated by EU law. 
As regards to return procedure, we see a similar, well, I would say ambiguity. Um, according to the staff working document, irregular migrants in a return procedure would not be subject to detention as a rule. At the same time, member states are obliged to keep applicants whose applications have been rejected in a border return in border facilities until the enforcement of the return decision. Now, the vagueness surrounding the relationship between non-entry and the use of detention in the pact is striking for a number of reasons. In the first place, until it presented the pact last year, the, com the Commission has consistently argued, so both in 2013 and 2016, in the proposal for the uh, asylum procedures that, uh, regulation, um, that border procedures imply detention. In 2013, it added that that was the reason these should be used only in exceptional circumstances. It's striking that in the pact there is no explanation for its apparent change uh, in position, say. It says these procedures can be used without detention. Now why? Why that change? And that change is actually particularly striking, which could also be the reason for its silence, uh, seeing that uh, the number of detentions will probably increase, or the number of border procedures will increase, seeing that it becomes mandatory, it is extended in scope during times of, uh, uh, of crisis, um, uh, both in scope and in time. It's also for another reason striking that the pact is silence, silent on the relationship between detention and uh, non-entry, and that is because the, the pact, when it was for, put forward by the Commission, the Commission indicated that it aimed to tackle uh, quite a few problems. And two of these problems uh, were uh, the uneven application of EU law across the member states. So that's the first problem. And the second was uh, the lack of an effective system for migrants to access their rights. Now, the lack of legal clarity uh, on the use of detention and pre-entry makes these ambitions sound a little bit hollow. What is seen as detention in one member state may well not be seen as such in another member state. And actually, we already see this happening under the much stricter current rules. For example, the airport procedure in Germany is not seen as deprivation of liberty, whereas an almost similar procedure at Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands is uh, qualified as detention. I think it's even more important when it comes to the existing data, it is very uh, clear that practices of de facto detention, so that's detention without a clear legal basis and no possibilities for judicial review, they are widespread already under the current stricter rules. Now, the lack of clarity will only aggra aggravate these problems. And uh, I doubt whether the monitoring system that states are uh, uh, obliged to set up will be able to, to provide answers to these, uh, to these problems. I now turn very briefly to the legal discussion on qualification. Uh, I don't have the time to really delve into the uh, interest. You know, it's, it's a very complex, uh, complex area, and uh, I'm limited in time. Um, but, but I just wanted to underline also in this presentation that it's not only member states that differ um, in how they qualify these measures, whether they are detention or they are not, but it's also the two constitutional courts in Europe that uh, seem to disagree on this matter. And I, I can't really set out the, the, the details of the diverging case law on this point, but maybe it suffices to remind you of, of the cases that you, you certainly heard of them. Uh, the keeping of, of uh, asylum seekers in the transit zone between Hungary and Serbia was not qualified as detention by the European Court on Human Rights in Ilias and Ahmed. And then um, a while later, the Court of Justice of the EU did qualify it as detention. Uh, in the case of FMS and also a later case, Commission versus, versus Hungary. And I'm, I'm, I mean, there may be differences in these, in these uh, the chair can maybe tell us much more also about the Hungarian domestic uh, uh, legislation. There are differences between these cases. It's too complex to, to address it here. But I want to highlight that the Court of Justice drew on an autonomous interpretation of EU law, uh, stating that detention is a coercive measure that deprives an applicant of his or her freedom of movement by requiring him or her to remain permanently within a restricted and closed perimeter. So that's detention according to EU law. Now, in most cases, the fiction of non-entry requires precisely that. Coercive measures, 
which deprive individuals of their freedom of movement by requiring them, requiring them to remain permanently within a restricted and closed perimeter. As such, Article 6 of the Charter is applicable to these measures, prescribing a necessity and a proportionality review of the detention and the guarantee of judicial review. I leave aside other legal guarantees because we don't have time with that, for that. Now, with specific regard to the judicial review of detention, I wanted to touch upon one important thing that I have not seen commented so much upon in, in comments on the pact. And I think it's a serious problem. So seeing that member states during times of crisis may apply the border procedure to persons coming from countries with a recognition rate of 75% or lower, and that the asylum border procedure may in these cases last 20 weeks, the pact is creating a situation according to which large numbers of refugees can be detained at external borders for many months. Aside from the fact that this raises serious questions with regard to conformity with international refugee law, of course. I think we also have to be mindful, and Lira, you already mentioned it uh, a little bit, the courts are often far away, but these people have a right to a speedy judicial review of their detention. I, I, I don't see logistically how that can be organized. Um, so so that, is, that is a, a, a serious problem. Now, I want to conclude my presentation with an invitation to the audience and also maybe my co-panelists if they, if they feel like it and maybe after, uh, after we, uh, we have a cup of coffee. I, I would like to, to raise the question whether our current uh, fundamental rights framework is actually fit um, to address the challenges that arise when states attempt to shift their borders. The shift, shifting border is a term coined by Ayelet Shahar, of course, you know, describing a a tendency that we witness already a much longer time, but pre-entry procedures are a very good illustration of shifting borders, shifting borders out, outwards. And I think when we talk about detention and pre-entry, we really clearly see this blurring between containment, limitations on freedom of movement, and detention. And it is, it is true, and we know from the case law of the European Court on Human Rights that the difference between a deprivation of liberty and a mere restriction on freedom of movement, uh, the court always says that's, that's not a matter of um, uh, substance of nature, it's, it's a matter of degree and intensity. Now that makes sense, but what happens after it has been, had the, the, the measure in itself has been qualified as detention or a limitation on freedom of movement, these different shades of gray suddenly disappear, then it suddenly becomes black and white. When it's detention, you have the right to a speedy judicial review of your, of your detention uh, and release if the administration has acted unlawfully. Similar guarantees are not applicable when it comes to limitation on, on freedom of movement. Um, and I, I, I think that setup does not do justice to the complexities that shifting borders introduce. And I think we need fresh ideas in, in our human rights framework and also in EU law, of course, which can grapple with the novel techniques that states use uh, to shift their borders outwards or inwards or uh, to regulate and manage mobility, just as um, different social, political and economic phenomena over history gave rise to new rights. I think we also need uh, innovative remedies that uh, can, can make us address uh, contemporary uh, regulation of mobility. And uh, now I'm really almost finished, but I just want to add that, in my opinion, a very good start would be um, to provide every individual in a pre-entry procedure with the right to have his or her legal situation reviewed speedily by court, who can order the lifting of the measures, no matter how they are qualified, if these are not necessary or proportionate to the individual situation. Thank you. Thank you, Galina, and also to the kind invitation to now take the floor and speak 15 minutes about FMS and Ilias and Ahmed, but I won't do that. I just draw your attention to the fact that there is a more recent judgment issued by the European Court of Human Rights in 2021, March, RR and others, in which the court painfully reviews its Ilias judgment and aligns with FMS, so it reviews its earlier judgment. The core being that in the Ilias was a, broader, a genuine border procedure, less than four weeks, FMS and RR until detention for months. That much being said, uh, I'm really glad to give the floor 
to my long-standing friend, Jens Westert Hansen, who will speak about the lucky ones who end up in the asylum procedure. Thank you, Bolli. Uh, well, first, we try to keep them outside, uh, at least outside the procedure. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, four issues here, uh, all interlinked, of course. First, about the linkage between border procedure and pre-screening, very briefly, just to build the bridge back to Lira's presentation. Secondly, about the issue of mandatory versus optional border procedures on asylum. Then, the link between border procedures and acceleration grounds, accelerated examination procedures. Uh, and fourthly, the asylum return link. Uh, all in 10 minutes, hopefully. Uh, I think uh, it is fairly clear, as already uh, actually explained by Lira, that the uh, pre-entry screening will serve uh, purposes of allocation to the subsequent procedures. And uh, I would say also, in line with Lira's point, that there will be quite some scope of maneuver for, for, for national law and policy making. I think there is a real risk or a real chance, if you want, uh, of a de facto merging of the pre-entry screening and the subsequent asylum and return border procedure. There will probably be uh, member states in which it may become difficult to distinguish clearly between the second and the third, uh, sorry, sorry, the first and the second and third stages uh, of, of, of this uh, course of events. And that, of course, highlights also the question uh, of the nature, uh, the legal nature of the outcome of the pre entry screening. Um, the uh, screening regulation proposal. Uh, uses the term debriefing. Uh, and if you look into Article 13, uh, outlining what the debriefing is supposed to, to be about, it is very clear that it may potentially impact subsequent decisions on at least admissibility, but probably also on substance uh, in the asylum procedure. So much about that link. Then secondly, uh, the question of mandatory or optional border procedures. I think uh, it is clear from the, uh, there's a change, a shift, so to say, from the 2016 uh, proposal for an asylum procedure regulation to the 2020 uh, amended proposal uh, for an uh, asylum procedure regulation uh, to the effect that, that we, will have, we will see, according to the, uh, the latter instrument, which is a part of the package under the new pact, we will see a tendency towards uh, mandatory application of the asylum border procedure. Uh, apparently, there was a compromise first in the 2016 proposal that if an ex acceleration ground uh, is, exists, then member states will be obliged to accelerate the examination procedure. But uh, the application of the uh, border procedures would still be uh, optional for member states under the 2016 proposal. The 2020 amended proposal will uh, introduce a, a difference here so that some, some cases of cer certain acceleration grounds will trigger mandatory application of the asylum border procedures. In the explanatory memorandum, the Commission explains that there is a divide among member states regarding the desirability and even feasibility of examination of asylum applications at the border. And this split among member states is probably the reason why the Commission is now sort of suggesting another compromise solution. The thing is that, the, or the idea is that uh, as a starting point, the asylum border procedure, as I mentioned, will be still optional. Uh, and it's, on the other hand, if member states opt for that, they will be able, as under the current Asylum Procedures Directive, to make decisions both on admissibility and on substance in an accelerated procedure as part of the asylum border procedure. Uh, then, um, the new compromise is that asylum border procedure will be uh, mandatory in three different situations, all of which are based on acceleration of the examination. This is complex, really. Sorry for that. Um, 
in three situations where there will be accelerated examination, the member state will also be obliged to, to carry out that examination in the border procedure. That is, if the applicant has misled the authorities. Secondly, if the applicant may, for serious reasons, be considered da a danger to national security or public order. And thirdly, if the applicant's country of origin has an average recognition rate at 20% or lower. And this is then my third point, uh, the new acceleration ground uh, proposed in the amended proposal uh, with, with the, uh, with the um, uh, new pact uh, of September 2020. The uh, idea here is to introduce the new acceleration ground to which reference has already been made, um, which is based on the statistical average of recognitions from the country of origin, uh, either country of nationality or country of former habitual residence, if it is a stateless applicant for protection. Um, and for that, you can say various things. I don't have time to do that. We'll just point out to the, point to the, to, to the um, very uh, particular, not to say peculiar, amplification uh, based on the uh, proposed uh, crisis regulation that this limit of 20% can raise to 75% uh, in cases of crisis, meaning that, that, that even then there will be a sort of fictitious presumption that, that, that cases are unfounded or whatever be the uh, justification here. In any event, uh, this is the objective rule. As the Commission is uh, suggesting in the explanatory memorandum, it's an easy to use criterion, <laughs> surely. That, that can't be disputed. But the rest is not so easy to use because there will then, of course, have to be exemptions. Uh, and those exemptions or exceptions uh, will be two different situations. If there is a significant change in the contrary origin since the basis of the statistical average was produced, let's just think about Afghanistan, which must be a, a current example of this. Uh, I don't know whether it was below 20% before, but, but at least it must be, be, be above 20% now. That may not be so difficult to decide, although still contrary origin information assessment is not an easy thing. But the second exception is far more pop complex. That is, if the applicant belongs to a category of persons for whom the proportion of 20% or lower of recognition uh, rate cannot be considered as representative for their protection needs. Um, that's, that's the wording, more or less. And here, I think, uh, we simply uh, are confronted with a contradiction in terms. Here, we are talking about uh, a ground for allocation into an accelerated examination procedure, which is even supposed under a mandatory rule to, to, under, under a mandatory rule to take place in the border context. And then we have an exception based on this uh, belonging to a category for whom the uh, average cannot be considered as representative for the protection needs. This will be, I mean, it's, it, the contradiction is uh, quite obvious, I think. Uh, this cannot really uh, seriously take place in, a, in an accelerated procedure if it is going to be meaningful. And therefore, if we are looking for either hidden agendas or uh, unintended effects, I would assume that we would risk having an irrebuttable presumption here. It, will, it may in practice well become close to impossible to rebut the presumption uh, or rather to, 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 to avoid the effect of this 20% rule by proving that your uh, protection needs are, are different. How, how would that happen in, in reality within an accelerated procedure in the border situation? Now, my fourth uh, remarks will be on the link between asylum and return, and I think I need to be, to be quick here. Uh, it's important to say that the mandatory link between decisions on asylum and return will apply to all negative decisions. There have been some assumptions that this would only be a matter of the border procedure. That's not true. It is clear from the amended proposal that there will be an, a mandatory link so that every negative decision on admissibility or, or on protection needs has to be accompanied by a return decision, either in the same uh, decision or at a simultaneous separate act. 
Then, in addition, uh, if uh, the application has been examined in the asylum border procedure, then the return border procedure must also apply, means that then the person will go directly from the as examination and the negative outcome to a return procedure. And here again, we have the term that there is no right to, 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 to entry. The, the person shall not be authorized to enter, uh, which triggers exactly the same problems as um, Galina just explained about uh, limitation of, of movement uh, amounting possibly to detention. And this is terminological and important shift from the current directive which quite to the opposite talks about a right to remain in the territory. Here we, in principle, never entered the territory, although you will soon be subject to return from the territory. So we have also here a terminological uh, challenge, we could say. Uh, this, of course, is all about migration management. Uh, and I think it, that, that's the way we can explain it, uh, that, that the border procedure and the link between asylum and return border procedures will be, has been introduced and will be applied as migration management tools. I can see good practical reasons uh, for a closer link between the two, the two uh, at least at, at the decision-making stage. ECRE has, on the other hand, also raised strong reasons or warnings against this direct link. Uh, so, so, so some things have to be sorted out here. But in any event, uh, there will be challenging as to the existence and usage of procedural safeguards within this framework. Uh, the question will be whether the presumptions of unfoundedness, one way or the other, can in reality be rebutted in this context. And thirdly, it all hinges on whether these people will actually be deportable from the border situation. I mean, this is also a fiction here. That, that there is a belief that if we just make the connection between the decision and the return procedure closer, swift, as is the term, or seamless, as the Commission suggests, then uh, the problem will be solved, people will be gone one way or the other. But it all depends on the actual deportability of these persons. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, whether people will be returned or not, and in what way, and on, on what grounds, that is the field of Madalina Muraru, who is going to take the field. You have 10 minutes, as the others have, and so if you use 12, I will tolerate it, but not more. Thank you, Baltizan, for your kind addition of two minutes. And um, I would like to start, first of all, by thanking Philippe and Daniel for inviting me to participate, uh, both in the blog series and in the conference, uh, and of course, uh, Nicole and Marco for the wonderful organization. Um, and I'll go straight ahead to the topic of my uh, presentation, uh, which um, focuses on the mandatory return border procedure. And I'll take uh, both a positive and a critical perspective because I would like to emphasize um, both on the added value but also on the remaining shortcomings, which I think they need to, to be addressed. Um, this, actually, it's not my slides, so um, I think I'll ignore the slides that are there on the screen, and I'll just uh, talk uh, openly um, to you. So um, I think the discussions that we uh, heard so far were very much focused on the pact and the legislative, uh, asylum legislative package part of the pack. But when we discuss mandatory retort border procedure, we have to look um, at another instrument, uh, which is the key EU instruments on return procedure, and that is the return um, directive. And this instrument has been the object of a separate reform from the pact, which actually started in 2018 uh, with a proposal from the European Commission to recast the return directive. And as part of this 2018 proposal, there is also a um, model of mandatory return border procedure, which I will highlight is quite different from what we have in the proposal in the PAC that is in the asylum procedure uh, regulation. Now, the status on this initial model uh, is quite uncertain because, for instance, the Council um, in its partial agreement from 2019 has not put forward uh, its opinion. And then if we look at the uh, 2020 draft LIBE 
um, committee report, we see that the European Parliament actually proposed to repeal uh, that model. But of course, um, the, the whole status of, of the recast in a stalemate because we don't have not even a final uh, report uh, adopted by the Parliament. But now going to um, the model that we have in the pact on mandatory regional border procedure, I would say it's e it is definitely an added value compared to the 2018 model um, in terms of enhanced procedural safeguards. Um, and we have their mandatory vol voluntary departure period, which was not present in the 2018 model. Also, the return decisions have to be fully justified and based on individual assessment, not on template decision, which was the initial proposal. And we also have longer period of appeal. So instead of 48 hours, we have uh, one week. And children under 12 and vulnerable groups are excluded um, from the scope of mandatory return border procedure. Now, that being said on the added value, I would like to concentrate on three main shortcomings. Um, um, for the proposal that is uh, embedded in the pact. Uh, and I'll start first with the diminished judicial control over return uh, decision, which I would say it's a wrong message that is given by the Commission within a context that we see already an undermined judicial accountability of the executive. Uh, so first, we will have a decreasing number of competent courts that will be able to review the return decision because allocation of jurisdiction in um, return border procedure will be based on geographical proximity. And this is also what Lira has emphasized. Uh, secondly, there's no automatic suspensive effect of the appeal. Furthermore, member states have discretion even as regards recognition of ex officio judicial power, even when there is a risk of a uh, violation of the principle of non refoulement And that, I think, I don't know how it squares with the recent jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice, uh, which in case 23319, uh, it says automatic suspensive effect of appeal has to be recognized on the basis of Article 13 of the Return Directive, Article 19, 2 and 47 of the Charter, even if the national court does not have that competence under national law. Uh, third, um, I raise a point which I think touches on what has been said by, my previous, uh, by the previous speakers, and that is ineffective rights of defense. Of course, we have a higher uh, time um, limit, time for appeal, that is one week, but that one week um, is for appealing both the rejected asylum application and the return decision because they are mixed in the border procedure. Um, and we have that in a situation where in practice, um, in many uh, countries, Czech Republic, especially Central and Eastern Europe, uh, access to these uh, centers in the border procedure is one, uh, once per week. Um, and the last point I want to make on that is, so we have this context of uh, diminished judicial control in a context where we see systemic pushbacks uh, coupled with non-compliance of final judgments by the executive, and we see a continuous series of judgments delivered by the European Court of Human Rights, most recent ones in July against Hungary and uh, Poland. Uh, so I would say this is definitely a wrong message that the Commission gives at the national level. Basically, it's fine not to have the courts reviewing what is done in the uh, mandatory return border procedure. Second shortcoming, Policy fragmentation, um, which is undermining policy coherence with the return directive and the Schengen acquis. So we have the mandatory return border procedure inserted in the asylum procedure regulation. And it's unclear whether it will apply or not to the Schengen associated states, as is the case with the return directive. And we'll definitely risk to have two parallel return procedure. Uh, offering different procedural safeguards based on nationality, as was also uh, highlighted by Jens, due to the uh, minimal rate of recognition. The second source of fragmentation is the wide margin of discretion which is recognized to the member states to decide whether to apply or not the return directive and the Schengen border code, e code in border-like cases. So what we have here is a sheer technical complexity 
And we definitely don't have an enhancement of the stated objective of harmonization, which is said in the pact, but actually a divergent practice and sheer complexity of going back between different various instruments where you end up in a situation where you don't know which one is applicable. Third uh, shortcoming, and I'll uh, be close to concluding, is data estimation issue and the, the data that is provided by the um, uh, European Commission in the pact. Um, and that is, um, for instance, we have uh, concrete proposals for time uh, limitation for appeal for the whole duration of the mandatory return border procedure, but we don't have any data to back up this concrete proposal. There's no comparative analysis of domestic border procedure and how they function to back up the proposal by the Commission. Secondly, um, the um, uh, return border procedure is modeled on the basis of recognition and return rates that take into account only the first instance decision not uh, also the percentage of upheld administrative decision by courts. And there's a recent study in Germany um, which says the high impact of the famous Gnandi judgment, uh, where close to almost like 50% of the deportation warning are actually annulled by courts, for also following the German Federal Administrative Court. So definitely we should be careful at looking at the data that is provided. And lastly, uh, questionable efficiency. The gap between theory and practice is something that Daniel has raised in the beginning. And I raised the question is, does the time efficiently actually translate increased return rates? I would say no. If we look, for instance, at uh, the Bath uh, uh, study on Germany, um, the Ancon centers where the return rate is actually lower in the mixed centers and the border centers. Secondly, financial implications. Um, the comments provided by the Mediterranean uh, countries, they actually have rejected the use of border procedure because the financial implication actually outweighed the efficiency. And to conclude, I'd just like to mention, of course, I've started my presentation with the added value of the PACT uh, model of uh, mandatory return border procedure, which is definitely a step forward compared with what we have from the Commission proposal in 2018. But uh, it is very important to choose our element of comparison. Um, if we look to that very low threshold, of course, it's a step forward. But if we consider, as also the previous speakers have said, that the uh, mandatory return border procedure will not be an exception, but actually the rule, then what we have in practice is actually a replacement of the higher protection framework guaranteed by the regular return procedure in the return directive with definitely a weaker um, protection uh, framework as is the model in the pact. Thank you for your attention and I apologize for the uh, trouble, technical trouble with the slides. Thank you, Madalina. You heroically mastered the, mastered the crisis. I wish the commission could do the same. Uh, and now we are looking forward the comments of Tomasz Molnar, again an old friend of mine, who is assumed to be at the Fundamental Rights Agency and appear on our screen. Tomasz, welcome here. We are very much looking forward to your comments. Did you hear the presentations? Yes, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Mr. Chair, dear Boldijar, thanks for giving me the floor, and I confirm that I have heard everything. It was clear, loud and clear. So uh, to kick off, this is my great privilege and honor to be here with you, uh, albeit only virtually online, but I, I'll, I'll do my utmost. I mean, being in the position of the commentator, it's uh, uh, it's at the same time a wing and a fardel. So, I mean, uh, 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 this uh, lineup of distinguished scholars uh, for uh, rich uh, and informative presentations, really thought provoking and providing a lot of food for thoughts. And I have only 10 minutes, as far as I know, to, to provide some, some yes. comments in a, in a structured way. Two caveats apply. Uh, I will try to go through the, the order of the presentations, which is also the natural logic of, of the processes, starting from the screening through the asylum border procedure and ending with the uh, return border procedure. And also the second caveat is that from the, mainly from the fundamental rights perspective, of course, uh, uh, this is the underlying rationale that we talk about individuals, human beings, 
and migration asylum issues uh, touch upon the lives of those people. So there's an inherent fundamental rights driven thinking, but, but uh, also given my institutional affiliation, that will be the main uh, angle. To kick off with the, um, the, the um, <clears throat> pre-entry screening uh, procedure, I just would like to uh, reiterate again the, the kaleidoscope uh, uh, of the possible uh, procedures to, to follow after, after screening, it's just, uh, which also underpins the, the seriousness of the outcome of, of, of screening. It might be an asylum procedure, as Lira mentioned, either the border procedure, or an accelerated asylum procedure or the regular asylum procedure, or it can be a return procedure. Uh, according to the language of the proposal, uh, people uh, uh, must be uh, channeled into procedures respecting the return directive, since uh, it, it might be the case that uh, if the, the return directive fully applies in uh, border scenarios, then uh, the return decision must be issued, then the process starts with all the safeguards and so on. But for countries, member states opting out uh, uh, for border cases under Article 22A of the return directive, then national law applies, although some basic rights and safeguards must be also uh, respected under Article 44 of the return directive in those cases. Uh, plus, we have the refusal of entry as a possible outcome after the, the screening. So it, it's really uh, uh, everything and everything. It's, it's a lot, not mentioning the, the complexities. One uh, outcome is like it lies within the asylum maquis. Another one is, is the return maquis. And the third one is the Schengen maquis with the refusal of entry. And all this needs well-qualified staff. So the screening authorities will play an instrumental and, and, and crucial role in, in that. But when, if we look at the, the provisions on, on qualified staff uh, of the proposal, um, uh, it speaks about appropriate staff and, and the sufficient resources, but the screening draft is silent on their qualification. It doesn't require that the screening authority is well trained uh, in identifying asylum applicants or THP victims. Uh, and, and I mean, that creates a lot of protection uh, risks amongst other uh, uh, problems. And this leads to uh, us to the, um, the outcome. So the outcome of the screen, the former outcome is a debriefing form, which doesn't qualify uh, uh, for a, a formal decision. This is legal abracadabra. I mean, uh, setting aside the fact that debriefing form as a term is used differently in the 2019 Frontex regulations already it causes, causes some confusion. Uh, uh, it's, it's a no-go that it's, it's not a formalized decision. Uh, the the uh, right to an effective remedy as enshrined in the EU Charter requires uh, a formal uh, uh, decision to, 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 to uh, make it possible that the person concerned can exercise the, the right to judicial uh, uh, review and uh, the exercise uh, of, of that right cannot be uh, waived. And, and um, another thing, uh, if we say, uh, and now I'm, I'm the devil's advocate to some extent, that this is not a decision, but still this is a collection of personal data. So the GDPR kicks in and the processing of personal data as uh, collected in the form of this debriefing form is subject to safeguards under GDPR, including the right to uh, access to that data, to correct, to, to, to review, and also to, to erase if there are some, uh, uh, how to say, inconsistencies. So even the GDPR and, and, and its, its, its set of safeguards when it comes to collective personal data is applicable to what is written in the, uh, uh, this bit oddly uh, entitled uh, debriefing uh, form. And one uh, experience from, from the ground. Um, uh, what Fra has experienced uh, in the Greek hotspots, the, the screening interview currently carried out is not recorded anywhere. And uh, interviews carried out by Frontex staff have often resulted in incorrect registration of personal data, such as age or, and nationality. So lawyers uh, Fra, uh, uh, <clears throat> spoke with, uh, raised this, this issue. So the point is that uh, there might be inconsistencies and not only on the, on the form, but more broadly, uh, uh, wrong referrals at the end of the screening uh, can be a question of life and death. If someone is referred to the asylum or the return process or just is issued a refusal of entry under the Schengen Borders Code. 
and uh, I could you continue with, with a number of fundamental rights related uh, uh, issues in the in the screening uh, proposal, like the procedural safeguards seem to be insufficient, the duty to inform is minimalistic, there's no duty to involve interpreters during the, the screening, but without interpretation, uh, uh, it's, it's just you, you, the authorities cannot go uh, f uh, uh, far. Then the health and vulnerability checks have already been mentioned by Lira that they are not compulsory in some cases. Uh, then identification, which is one of the uh, main goals. This is uh, heavily uh, relying on searching in the common identity repository, one of the new uh, tools in the interoperability, uh, 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 let's say, uh, domain. Uh, and given that these people mostly arrive uh, without travel documents and the quality of data stored in the IT systems, which are checked using the, the STIR, the common the repository, uh, uh, are, are not, uh, how to say, uh, fully accurate, then false matches are not unlikely. And false matches might uh, relate to, might lead to, again, quite uh, harsh consequences if the people is referred to a return process instead of asylum or the people is associated with the terrorist suspect and then that's why it's, it's uh, excluded for, from, from asylum. Um, so there are a number of, of, of uh, issues but uh, now I would like to talk a bit about the, the fiction of, uh, of non-entry, uh, uh, legal fiction of, of, of non-entry which uh, okay let's say this excludes the application of EU second legislation uh, on asylum and, and, and return but uh, um, other safeguards uh, continue to apply, including uh, the European Commission on Human Rights, for instance, and of course the EU Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights and, and all, all the rights. Um, but the, 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 why this fiction of law entry can help the authorities? First, uh, uh, the detention ground under Article 5, 1F, first limb of the ECHR, which means uh, detaining uh, migrants, uh, preventing their irregular entry, can be exploited, can be fully used. Uh, if this is legally a non-entry situation, then uh, this legal basis gives member states like the license to put uh, people in, in detention. And unfortunately, we know that uh, uh, the screening proposal is quite opaque and, and, and shy on that front. Uh, detention issues are just wishy-washy mentioned and deferred to national legislation. It's up to, detention is up to national law, point final, which, which of course uh, 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 raises a lot of, lot of uh, issues and, and uncertainties. And the other consequence that some provisions of the 51 Geneva Refugee Convention can be excluded uh, during this fiction of, of uh, non-entry, those rights under the Geneva Convention which are linked to lawful stay of the applicant, like freedom of movement or access to certain uh, uh, social uh, uh, rights. Then let's uh, talk about the uh, uh, challenges in implementation and, and how uh, both the screening, but uh, predominantly the uh, border procedures, both the asylum and return uh, uh, border procedures uh, can take place uh, and, and what, is, what, what is their feasibility. It, again, what FRA has seen in, in, in our research and also our field presence in hotspots in Greece and Italy, also our visits to Hungary and transit zones, that border procedures uh, uh, which take place in facilities near uh, or in proximity of the external borders, uh, bring along difficulties in ensuring adequate reception standards in those facilities at the borders, especially where it's difficult to provide all the services required, uh, interpreters, lawyers, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, uh, well-trained professionals uh, on child protection matters, on identifying THP victims, other vulnerabilities. So if we, we place all this in remote areas uh, like uh, the Hungarian-Serbian border or uh, the hotspots uh, on the Aegean islands uh, or other remote areas, there are almost insurmountable difficulties to meet uh, those conditions. And what we have also uh, Observe that uh, the longer the stay, the longer the stay in in such centres, the more difficult it becomes to uphold dignified reception conditions set out in 
in, in EU law, not mentioning overcrowding, no matter what is the size of the facility, if these capacities are stretched and people are kept there for weeks, 12 weeks, or in case of crisis, 20 weeks, and it accumulates it, until the end of the, the return border procedure, someone can be uh, kept in, in detention for six months. This is a lot. And, and during that time, uh, overcrowding can can uh, easily happen, which is a key hurdle to to dignified uh, stays, of course. Tomas, um, Tomas, I yes. don't want to interrupt you. They're just indicating that you are at the thirteenth minute. Okay, now I, I I'll, I'll wrap up. Just uh, one, uh, let's say, um, thought on detention. Uh, in the asylum border procedure, what we see that it can uh, member states can resort in practice to detention by default on the basis of of uh, uh, detention ground the reception conditions directive to decide on the applicant's right to enter so again it's it's a license to to to, to use detain detention as default as a default option and under the return uh, border procedure um it's uh, it's the ground seem to be essentially automatic for those uh, persons who were already detained during the asylum border procedure then the accelerated procedure. The accelerated procedure, there's this new ground minus 20% recognition rate. Just one thing, uh, what about unaccompanied children? The current accelerated procedures establish exceptions for them, but the new, this new minus 20 recognition rate is across the board, including unaccompanied children. And it raises the issue uh, that uh, is this justified in light of their special needs and heightened vulnerability. Um, and the final thing is the return uh, border procedure, uh, just telegraphically. Uh, possibility to issue a refusal of entry after 12 weeks of stay. It's quite weird, and this is also at odds with the legal nature uh, of, of, of the process. I mean, we have an asylum legislation, which is the amended asylum proposal, uh, and, and the Schengen Borders Code, which is part of the Schengen Acquis. What about the safeguards? There are derogations under the Return Directive safeguards. It needs to be clearly assessed uh, what remains from, from those safeguards. And the whole issue of effective uh, remedy, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, problematic. Uh, because of this joint and parallel examination of appeals against asylum and border return decisions. There's a risk that the appeal focuses only on the asylum decision and not on the elements which may be unique to the return decision. Other bars to removal, uh, Article 8, Article 6 of the ECHR, or Noah Fumo as a human rights requirement, not just as a refugee law requirement. Well, so well. Uh, I will stop here. Thanks for your time and sorry for being exhaustive, but I definitely couldn't live up to the expectation of being succinct and keeping my time. Thank you so much. I'm sure FRA is happy to have you on board because you are so emotional about those issues, and that's right so. Now, as a traditionalist, let us maintain the tradition of addressing those who might still be online and watch us and listen to us. And let me ask our colleagues if there are questions which came in online, and then we will turn to the audience here. Yes, we have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what would be the role of the monitoring mechanism uh, to ensure the respect of fundamental rights? And then a uh, second question on mainly directed to uh, Professor Cornelis and uh, Mr. Molnar. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more uh, on the fiction of non-entry and its implication from a fundamental right perspective? Uh, so why is the legal fiction uh, stressed both in, uh, in the screening regulation and uh, asylum procedure regulation? Thank you. I suggest that you answer these two questions now. Cornelissa, would you like to start? Galina, sorry. Okay, yes. Thank you. So, so the monitoring mechanism, that, that's a very broad question. I think the, the monitoring mechanism, I, I can briefly say a few things about it. It's to be set up by the member states uh, to ensure respect for fundamental rights. And, and I think also in the pact, it's not very clear. I think the... Um, Fundamental. I mean, actually, I think Tamas can explain uh, maybe a little bit more later. Fundamental rights agency can be of help in um, developing guidelines also for uh, the use of detention. 
to be honest, that's really all I can say about it. So uh, I'm not sure if that's because it just didn't seem so very um, uh, interesting or uh, because I didn't read it well. But I think the, the monitoring mechanism is really for national states to set up. And, and so it, there's a lot of uh, leeway there. Now, on the, on the fiction of non-entry, I... I could elaborate on how it uh, affects other human rights. Um, I, I think that I'm taking too much time, um, but but I I do think that there might also be problems with non-refoulement, um, uh, access to the asylum procedure, mainly also because of delays in in uh, you know the screening um, may actually be extended also in times of crisis. Um, and, and that seems in tension with case law of the Court of Justice on uh, effective access to the procedure. So the reception conditions directive may be excluded from the screening uh, um, uh, phase, but the procedures directive is not. So I, I think also there, there there are problems. But I I was listening also what uh, Thomas was saying about non-entry and the fiction and the reason for it. And um, I, I think... I don't really agree because I think the procedures directive is not um, the procedures regulation uh, is not excluded. So you, you, these people have a right to remain also under existing EU law, also during the screening. Um, so I would say it's much more about a belief in swift, effective returns. There is some kind of belief that these people can be returned more. More, more efficiently and effectively, if you do not let them go in the territory, and I do think there might be there might be some uh, some ground in believing that, which then of course has to be balanced with effective human rights protection. So I'm not saying it's a it's 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 a good thing to do, but that, but I think there's some um, there's a possibility to exclude the uh, applicability of the return directive. Actually, Manalina, when you said um, that this is a step backwards compared to the current system, I'm also not sure if I totally agree because member states are allowed to exclude the application of the return directive to people in, in, uh, in border procedures, uh, you know, pre presently. I think the fiction of non-entry is, is much more to do that there's kind of a, um, a turning around of reasoning. So the commission first saying border procedures imply the use of detention and now being very silent about detention, I think border procedures and the non-fiction of entry is used in order to say we are detaining everybody, but we don't need to be open about it. And, and why is that being done? And then maybe I want to make a link to Jens, to your presentation, what I found interesting, because you were talking about the rebuttal uh, when, when it, for example, concerns people with a um, recognition rate of coming from a country with, with a recognition rate of uh, lower than 75% in, in times of crisis. But I think... In order to understand these pre-entry procedures well, we also have to understand that it's not only the asylum seekers who are about to rebut or not. This is an obligation that is put on uh, states at the external borders. This is about, and then I'm not talking about the 75% in times of crisis because that's not mandatory, that's, that's allowed. But when we're talking about the 20%, but also the people with false documents and the people who then member states are under an obligation to use the, the pre-entry procedure. So that is something that has been instigated by, by EU states at the northwest of, of Europe. They want these people to be you know, kept at the borders. And keeping people at borders means you have to contain them, detain them. Yeah. And then the last thing about non-entry story. Oh, sorry, I'm going too long. I think also carrier claims, so the effectuation of carrier claims. If you, if you look at the, the relevant regulation, you can only you know, get, that, you know, get those airplanes to, to bring back people if you've refused them entry. So I think that's also a very important point. Surprisingly, no attention to it in the pact. Yeah. Thank you, Galina. Uh, um, I warn everyone that we have seven minutes left, and we certainly want to give the floor to those present in the room. So respondents should be fast. Thank you. Just, just one more, perhaps unintended, uh, uh, consequence of this uh, non-entry fiction. It just occurs to me that Article 2 of ECHR Protocol 4, about the freedom of movement, only applies to everyone lawfully within the territory. So if we don't qualify a situation as detention, 
then member states will be free to limit movements without having to respect Article 2 here. That could be a, a, an implication, at least, not necessarily intended. Tomas, if you are there, short comments. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks to your board. Uh, on monitoring mechanisms uh, in the screening procedure, I would uh, uh, refer to tomorrow's uh, panel since th there will be a, a, a self-standing panel devoted to that and I will be also commenting. So I, I, I would leave it here, uh, conscious of the time. When it comes to the uh, fiction of, of uh, non-entry, I think this is mainly meant to curtail the application of certain legal regimes, uh, legal safeguards and, and standards. The, it was very good that uh, Galina mentioned the carrier sanctions directive. This is again another one uh, or, or uh, the uh, <clears throat> Uh, respective rule in the uh, protocol uh, to the ECHR on the restrictions of freedom of movement, which requires lawful stay. So uh, legally speaking, you can just square the circle, at least to some extent, and, and exclude the applicability of, of those legal regimes, which would, would complicate. And it, it also goes uh, with a curtailing rights of individuals uh, subject to uh, uh, that setting, although, and I repeat, uh, because member states implement EU law there as well, the charter kicks in and applies, and the same holds true for international human rights law in uh, general. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now the floor is open for all those of you who are here. Raise your hand. I see one hand. I, I do apologize. I don't know your name, but... Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Marta from PICUM. Thank you very much for the floor. And thank you very much to the speakers. I have two questions. I will start with one, and then um, I have to keep the second one for the coffee break, depending on time. Um, my question relates to what has been mentioned by Professor Hansen on the link between the asylum and the return procedures, um, and in particular, um, the obligation to issue a return decision together with the rejection of an asylum application, but also the fact that in the screening regulation, um, there are always kind of two pathways for people in a regular situation. So for instance, both people who are on the territory under Article 5, but also people who are arriving, can be channeled either to international protection, to asylum, or to return procedures. And uh, Professor Hansen has already raised what happens to uh, the question of what happens to people who cannot be deported, and I think that's a very valid question to which we have no answer to now. Uh, but I would also like to ask um, what happens to all the national residence permits which are currently existing, for instance, permits for medical reasons, humanitarian reasons, family or other reasons. And these permits both aim to address situations of non-deportability, but also situations in which people who are on the territory may have family, economic or social ties. And therefore my question to the speakers would be, do you think that these national permits would still be applicable under the pact, even if there is no reference to them? And even if the, the pact really stresses on the importance to channeling people either into asylum or to return? Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I would collect one or more questions if there are any. Yes, Ulrike. Um, many thanks for the interesting presentations. I'm really concerned about the fate of applicants in the various stages. The lucky ones come to the procedure and the other ones don't come to the procedure. Now, uh, my question relates to legal counseling. Obviously, the complex legal situation, the um, fiction of non-entry, detention, restriction of movement, if they are legally present, uh, requires uh, legal counseling and um, requires procedural guarantees, and I think um, we should discuss the issue as well. I know it's, um, it would require a long discussion, but perhaps there could be some comments about access of NGOs, legal counselors to uh, applicants, um, and I also, I'm a bit concerned about uh, legal counseling as we have new systems of state financed legal counseling which might of course be uh, not very useful for the clients because there is a strong connection to the administration. Thank you so much. Has any other question emerged in the meantime or remark? None. Then I give the floor to the panelists. Yes, probably. 
Yeah, thank you. I'm afraid I have to be very brief about the, uh, the, the question you, you addressed to me, if I understood it well. Um, I, I simply haven't thought of it. I, I do not see any immediate implications for, for residence permits based on national law. I, d I don't see why they should be particularly affected by, by this legisl these legislative initiatives. If you have any, any, uh, any uh, more specific reasons for that concern, I would be happy to learn about it in the break, but I, I, I can't think of it. I can't give a meaningful answer right now, actually, apart from this. Sorry. Do you want to extend your question? Uh, yes, I would be happy to if there is time. Thanks. Um, I think uh, I'm referring in particular to two sets of provisions. On the one hand, the amended asylum procedures regulation and the recast return directive are, are still being discussed, which foresee that together with the rejection of an asylum application, there will be directly a return decision. And secondly, the fact that the screening regulation says that both for people who are arriving irregularly under Article 3 and people who are on the territory under Article 5, the debriefing would end to a channeling of people either into the asylum procedures or into the return procedures. Now, we know, to give an example, for instance, of Italy, uh, despite the recent legal changes, we know that in a number of countries, actually in several countries, people are also able to access different residence permits, for instance, for medical reasons. I think at least 12 member states, according to Yemen reports, have permits that people who are currently regular can access for medical reasons. The same can be said for permits, for instance, um, based on family reunification in certain circumstances, as well as permits for humanitarian reasons, which are much broader in scope. Uh, that permit which are only based on international protection. However, because these are not mentioned and because there is a concrete obligation to channel people into return procedures, uh, my fear is that this will lead to really not a moment in the procedures in which whether these other permits are applicable. So at the moment we know that Article 6.4 of the Return Directive permits member states to consider whether there may be other permits on compassionate humanitarian grounds. But there is no such provision in the pact, which on the opposite really insists that a return decision should always be issued in any case in which there is no positive decision on the asylum. And we know that the asylum decision is much more restricted of other international obligations, including no refoulement, but also including private and family life as well as health grounds. So my question is, how can we really ensure that? And I think this is also something that has been raised by the impact assessment commissioned by the pact, which raises concerns on no refoulement. But my question is here a bit broader, because I think we're talking really about a very broad number of permits for children, uh, for instance. I am happy to share some sources on that and some mapping. Thank you. Thanks. Did you get through with it? No, I, I think I get it uh, more, more, more accurately. Uh, so I, I, I understand you're, you're now considering or concerned about the possibility to, to uh, apply for a, a residence permit uh, on the basis of domestic law. There I see the, the, the problem or the point. Um, in, in one way, uh, the raison d'etat would be that this is exactly what we want to avoid. We, we, by, by making this closer link, the swift or seamless connection between the asylum decision and return decision and enforcement, mm -hmm. member states, or at least the EU legislator, may, may actually intend to, to get rid of this uh, nuisance as it is perceived uh, in some instances, and I would say probably for sometimes for good reasons, that uh, rejected asylum seekers go on and go on and go on at, at trying to, to challenge and trying to find new, new grounds for apl applying for whatever residence permit. I, I can see a problem there. I can also understand, and at least I gather that, that, that member states may be, may, may be fed up with this situation and want to, want to squeeze that, uh, that interval, so to say. On the other hand, given that, that, that there may be good reasons for, for such strategies for, for on the side of applicants, I can also follow your concern. And again, of course, it also links to what I referred to, Ekres, uh, Ekres uh, pointing to the fact that, that, that if the return decision follows automatically from the negative asylum decision, th then there may be a, a, a problem with, 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 certain, with, with certain grounds for non refoulement that are not sort of absorbed by the qualification directive or regulation. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Madalina. Yeah, thank you. A short follow-up on the brilliant question regarding um, uh, per national permit uh, and, and the relation with the return directive. Um, I think there, there are three levels perhaps to consider here. 
Uh, one of them is that in one particular circumstances, it should not apply. There shouldn't be a conflict because, first of all, children under 12, they should not fall under the scope of the mandatory return border procedure. So humanitarian um, visas, like the one in Italy where children are not returned, they should not fall under this category. Similarly, vulnerability for uh, seriously ill, they should also not be channeled to uh, the mandatory return border procedure. So again, they should follow the normal uh, regular return procedure where this is possible. Now, the second level, which is even more complicated, is the fact that there is this definitely emphasis on the effectiveness of EU law, which expands to also the future package. And we've seen that approach, which is endorsed also by the European Court of Justice, for instance, the Tash and All, where the court has said that the effectiveness of the return directive functions in both negative and positive way. So even more favorable national provisions should not affect the effective implementation of the return directive. And so this perhaps is where things will be complicated. Um, and for those people who do not fall in these precise categories of children or, or vulnerable because of serious illness, then we might risk to have um, a, a situation where you said, and it's even more risky because I've mentioned before, there's very limited access to courts. So the possibility of having effective remedies to this type of claims will be probably inexistent, I would say. So. Thank you so much. Lira, you want, Galina, you want her. Okay, go ahead. No, I just wanted to say very briefly that in the screening re regulation proposal, it does say that uh, exceptions that member states may or should apply uh, on account of humanitarian grounds or, or medical reasons, these people do not have to be subjected to screening. So, why not? Thank you. Lira, you want to. Just a brief uh, comment on Ulrike's question. Of course, uh, uh, legal assistance, counseling, uh, depends on, on uh, practical availability of lawyers in, in those areas, border areas, uh, if uh, there will be containment, uh, detention of those persons. So some states, as we see in practice, they do not even allow NGOs, even UNHCR and, and lawyers to come. And secondly, it depends on, on the legal uh, accessibility, so to say, if we do not recognize that it is a decision and there is no remedy against that decision, if we do not uh, call it detention, uh, we call it something else, then uh, overall it might be questioned if lawyers are needed there. So that's very brief comment. It's much more complex that we, as we see in, in practice already. Some of those elements uh, implemented, but uh, it's uh, a very problematic uh, issue actually. Thomas, would you like to add anything on, on access to the people at the border by lawyers and others? Yes, very briefly on, on the two questions. The first, uh, the question to the representative of PICU might lie in Article 6, Part 4 of the Return Directive. And uh, this, this, this applies both under the screen regulation in my reading and also in the return uh, border procedure. Since the screen, screening proposal says that uh, in the scenario, people must be channeled into a procedures respecting the return directive. So here again, we have this legal regime opening up and if there are compassionate medical whatever grounds, uh, these can be, how to say, uh, uh, advanced and, and, and put forward and the member state can still uh, give the discretion and issue the residence permit. And uh, after the uh, rejection of the uh, asylum claim in the, uh, in the border procedure, then the proposal uh, lists those return directive provisions, which remain applicable in the return procedure. And Article 5, 6, Part 4 is amongst those. So I can see the legal links uh, arguing in this regard. And on the uh, access uh, of lawyers to uh, these areas and just legal assistance in uh, these uh, procedures as a form, form of uh, shameless self-promotion, FRA, our agency will soon uh, publish a comparative report on the actual practical realization of uh, legal aid in return uh, process across EU27. So stay tuned and I'll, I'll let you know once it's actually out. That's very good news. Thank you for that. I look around to, what, to see if there are any desperate voices, hands, but I see none. Then 
give me one mi minute. Um, is it alive or dead is in the title. And I was thinking maybe it's like the Schrodinger's cat. We can't know. But what we may know and on which we learned a lot is whether it's feasible for life. And my impression of this panel was that it is the whole pact as it is envisaged is not that feasible for life, for legal life. Which leads me to, to two concluding remarks more in the realm of law. One is that if rule of law presumes clarity, transparency, transparency predictability, then we are in a, a sad state because the Delphoi prophecies were clearer than the rules as we could learn here now. And in that sense, I'm relatively skeptical uh, unlike Mr. Überecken was, I believe that if we don't have a functioning regime on asylum uh, and on, if you want, broader migration management, then Schengen will break down. That's my fear. So, and, and this panel did not dissolve that fear today. But the happier note is that the coffee is awaiting me and now it is break time. Thanks very much for the panelists. Let's express our, express our gratitude to the panelists.